the entrance. Okay, June good. June the seventh, yeah, June the seventh. You can mark on your calendar. <laughs> <laughs> I will. I need. I need a reason, but um, they used to have a June trade show. I think that's been postponed. Oh, like, uh, sorry to interrupt a little bit. Hi, hi, Catherine. Hey, hi, how are you? <laughs> Wonderful. We are good. Hello, Catherine. I'm streaming live hi. on Facebook. Hi, hi, how are you? Everybody know that we'll be starting in about ten minutes, so we can okay. really chat um, among each other till then. Okay. Good to have you all here. All right, so we are going to start in 10 minutes. Now let's have a little look at uh, the questions. If you see the chat on your right, you have all the questions over there. And we are encouraging everybody watching to ask questions as well. So there will be popping up more questions on the chat. Yes? Mm -hmm. The chat. Chat, right. I'm looking for, yeah, uh, uh, chat, yes, okay. I see. Right. You just click to the chat button, then you'll have on your right, you'll see all the questions over there, and people can actually live just send more questions to us. It's just a little hard to read, I have to put my glasses on. <laughs> <laughs> as well. There you go, we are all ready. <laughs> so looking forward to having everybody joining us very soon. Good. All right. Yeah, it will be fun. Good. Yeah. For sure, for sure. Just before we start, I have to mention that I do apologize if there is some uh, invaders in, in my you know camera because my my daughter is like really naughty recently, <laughs> no school and uh, oh, we saw that not on sleeping we saw uh, on time. So, yeah, apologies in, in, uh, no in advance. Yeah. I think this is the new normal by now because we're seeing each other, you know, with um, with the children, wife, <laughs> husband, pets, family members. <laughs> Oh my God. Yeah. Quite an experience. Yeah, it is. All right. So I think we should be pretty much uh, ready to start. So eight minutes. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so, so how are we going to start? Uh, well, Anthony, you are the journalist. Would you like to start asking the questions? We're just a little intro about everybody, maybe that would be good. I mean, people already got to see who you are, what we do, but mm -hmm. it would be good that we can all introduce each other. Well. Okay, oh, so I'm gonna be the moderator. I didn't know that, okay. Oh, if you'd like to, <laughs> if you'd like to. <laughs> I'm fine with it, yeah. Mm -hmm. Here are the questions. They're, they're, they're the impossible questions. If we knew the answer, we'd be um, billionaires, I think. <laughs> but but they're well worth discussing. So For we sure. can maybe start with, um, how has the pandemic disrupted the retail sector? Since we're all mm -hmm. here and everybody's so concerned about that, I think that will help to start with. Okay, good. I don't want to start my video. I can see more and more people are joining us. Oh, good. Oh, people are starting to join already, huh? Good. Hi, Patrick. How are you, my friend? Long time no see. Good. Yeah. It's good to see you on the webinar. <laughs> Participants. Hi, Narcisa. Hello. Hi. Let's see. Okay. Hi, Lita. <laughs> I, oh, their camera's off. Okay. Um, so I think for the time being, we're only going to see the cameras of the um, guests. Speaker. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes, because otherwise it's going to be confusing looking everywhere. Oh, there are like okay. 100 people. 100 people. Uh, the other cameras, we won't see them, but we can uh, read the questions. Mm -hmm. 
and there would be a time when we can um, let them also ask live questions as well. Okay, very good. So everybody ready? Maybe we can just start a little bit earlier. Okay. Okay. All right. All right. So you want me to start? You want me to introduce everybody? Yeah. Sure. I think we're already live on Facebook already, as it is. Oh, okay, good. Yes. All right, and uh, we, we better get keep these um, people entertained, I guess. Um, well, good, e good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone. Um, we're here for industry talks. We're going to discuss the future of luxury brands and retail post um, pandemic. It's been, a, it's been an unprecedented time here and, and, and throughout the world. Uh, I don't think anything outside of a war or the Great Depression has, has even come close to what we've been experiencing now. But um, we have four wonderful speakers. Um, a first person I'd like to introduce is Narcisa Ferris who organized this whole thing. She's the CEO and creative director of Ferris and co-founder of the Great Institute. GR8. <laughs> GR8. It's great. It's great. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And then, and then next is a uh, Wen Hao Yu. He's the deputy cha chairman and uh, of jewelry for Asia and Hong Kong for Asia, um, Sotheby's Hong Kong. And then there's Catherine Kwong, who is the Asia Pacific leader of human resources practice and executive director for consumer retail and hospitality at Spencer Stewart. Um, and, and, and everyone here is based in Hong Kong, by the way, except for me. Um, and then there, finally, there's Nigel Smith, managing director of Collier's International, the Hong Kong office. Well, this so is we, we have it's a really good. great diverse panel here. And, um, and I'm sure there's gonna be a lot to um, discuss in the next hour or so. Um, would, would, um, would, would you like to take a moment to inter introduce yourselves or? Well, you did a wonderful job of introducing all of us. Thank you, Anthony. Thank you. So should we go uh, right into it? All right, shall we get straight to it? Because I'm pretty sure everybody is looking forward to hearing what, what we, we all have to have say, to not who we are. Now. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, so the first question is, um, how, has consumer, how has the consumer dynamic and preference changed since the beginning of the pandemic? Um, so I guess um, we're talking about um, how consumers have changed their buying habits. I think, I think luxury buying has um, sort of dwindled in, in, in the past few months throughout the world. Um, and it's obviously with all the retail outlets closed um, there's nowhere to shop except online and even online it's difficult for shipping and delivery of, of products around the world. It's difficult to move products around the world and it's difficult even to get employees to um, fulfill, to find fulfillment. So um, if anyone has, you know, can expand upon this. Well, how would you like to go first and talk about this? <laughs> we come from Sotheby's and we all know what happened recently, all the online sales booming and everything. Yeah. Thank you, Larissa. Thank you, Anthony. Uh, I'm honored to be here. Uh, thank you very much for organizing all this. And, uh, you know, it's a late, late hours and I really appreciate everyone in Hong Kong or in Asia to watch this. I think it's really important for us to understand the new trend of, uh, you know, we're talking about almost like a post COVID-19 kind of uh, 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 customer behavior. For South of these, uh, we've been prepared for the online sale since uh, years ago. So it is nothing new to us, but you know, since this happened and a lot of people try to keep a social distance, online sale, online shopping in general become a uh, new trend. And I remember that 2003 when uh, there was a SARS, you know, Alibaba, uh, Taobao, these, you know, these companies become very popular in, in China and grow enormously uh, in the last decades. But for uh, 
for online auction. I know it is, it is quite challenging, to be honest, even though uh, we had some success, but still, you know, talking about the, uh, the value, average value and the total turnover, uh, it's still not as, you know, the quantity or number is that not comparable with a live sale. But with all these challenges, we managed to have, um, so far since this year, about 70 million US dollars sold online at Sotheby's uh, across the globe. And uh, average sales rate is almost like 80 to 90%. We just had a 100% sale in April in Hong Kong for uh, diamond only jewelry pieces, which is quite surprised um, because, because we didn't expect with all these things going on. But uh, I guess if, uh, if you can show the product in uh, very much detail, as they can see from, from the, uh, the retail shop themselves, I think that, uh, ultimately it's a confidence. And also we have to really handpick what's suitable for our uh, client or potential uh, buyers. So that way we can secure more success in the, in the, in the, uh, in the sales. But in general, I think it is a new uh, environment is very challenging for everyone, different sectors in retail business, even for auctions. So uh, we just, you know, play and also testing and experience with everyone. So uh, I think it's a platform, uh, welcome all the different, you know, part of the business. So hopefully we can get through this and with a new invention, kind of new method of uh, uh, doing sales online or even uh, combine live sale and online sale. Thank you. Um, I have seen actually a quite interesting change in consumer behavior. Uh, somehow um, heritage brands seem to do very well. Uh, people are still looking for unique or um, easy to spot items. Um, and at the same time, very good designs are doing very well. People also look for something that is uh, different, new on the market, but somehow mid-market seems to suffer the most. Now, either people look for deals for very cheap products, a good price, good value, let's put it that way. They look for value, whether they look for something extremely unique. So this is what I've seen actually what's happening right now on the market. Um, also from technology point of view, I see a lot of AR and VR. People wanna have uh, like a 360 experience with the product. They wanna see like really, really well. So augmented and virtual reality are becoming actually a trend for, for anything, for online shopping. So uh, we are still a long way to go from now on. But I think people are more aware of pricing at this point, more than anything else. They are looking at pricing or values. Yeah, yeah. I, I would agree as well, uh, Nasiska, because um, um, you know, thank you for having me here. Uh, because when it's come to like you know jewelry and luxury, well, I think that you guys are all expert. You know, I'm just you know focused on executive search, but just having the fun, you know, with uh, talking with uh, different leaders, you know, across you know different price points. Uh, so that's also give me an perspective, you know, to uh, you know share with everybody. Uh, actually, you know, these few days in particular, you know, uh, everyone's know that you know China is going through you know the gold. The week. So I also try to make, you know, phone calls to my friends in China, you know, on a daily basis, you know, just want to get a feel, you know, about, you know, what's going on in the market. Now, you know, obviously, Narcissa, you, you, you said the right thing, you know, which is, uh, you know, the behavior, you know, certainly, you know, moving from, you know, um, offline to online. And then uh, one of the things that, you know, uh, what I agree, you know, absolutely is about you know, the price. Um, because, I mean, of course, I mean, we're talking you know, about, you know, different, you know, price point here, you know, on the heritage brand or the high value brand, there's always, you know, a segment of customer that, you know, they will be, you know, less price sensitive. But, you know, for the mass market, then, you know, uh, the middle brand that, you know, that are really, you know, kind of like, you know, suffering. So I think that, you know, when I speak with, you know, quite a number of, uh, you know, leader across, you know, different, in, uh, you know, different price point, uh, you know, product, then I think that how to redefine the brand positioning at this point, you know, is really, really important. Because, I mean, the price transparency, 
at this point will become an issue because I mean you can easily you know, find deals and compare price you know by all sorts of information and also now you know the search engine is so sophisticated you know to help every consumer to buy different category so from a luxury goods point of view you know in the past you know I think everyone is quite reluctant you know put to put you know the value product you know onto um, the expensive product you know onto the website but now I think that people's acceptance you know to buy high value tickets item you know become a habit and I believe this habit is at a point of no return uh, um, I you know I don't have a crystal ball here but I mean I'm just looking at myself um, you know after you know I'm not able to shop you know at like the you know, landmark or some of the places for a couple of months I think that a lot of people will like me okay let's get online to see what's out there so I'm sure everybody is doing that but I mean because of the choice transparency and also the comparison information are so easily assessed so I think that there will be a very big you know sort of price pressure putting on to all the luxurious leader you know to sort of like rethink about apart from price you know what would be the you know brand differentiation I think that will become one of the things that you know right now I'm sure going around you know everybody's mind shall I uh, just jump in and talk a little bit about from the real estate perspective um, I think we need to, when you look at the post-pandemic uh, changes in consumer demand and behavior, uh, we actually need to go a little bit further back. And particularly in Asia was affected by the uh, trade war, of course. In Hong Kong, then we had the protests last year, but that was much more localized. Now the uh, COVID-19 pandemic is, has gone completely global. We, when we look back, uh, if I just take Hong Kong as an example, in terms of uh, retail rents, we've re seen retail rents drop nearly 50% since uh, 2013. So there has been a dramatic fall. Um, the double digit growth that we saw with a lot of the luxury retailers in the early parts of the 2000s started, certainly started to, to, to close down, primarily because of the anti-corruption drive uh, in China. That said, you know, the drive from tourism across Asia has been incredible. I mean, I didn't even realize that Hong Kong is number three in Asia in terms of the direct and indirect tourism sales um, for GDP. About 18% of Asia's GDP comes from Hong Kong, just behind the Philippines and, and Thailand. So when you cut that off, it dramatically changes the real estate landscape. So what have we seen? Um, in Asia, the shopping center is still surviving. Uh, the trade mix is still surviving. What's changed in the shopping centers is that, uh, first of all, the waiting lists uh, for some of these prime retail shops has really gone down to almost zero. But at the same time, some of the big flagship stores uh, and the main retailers are not giving up those prime spots. The second thing we saw happen, uh, again, across Asia, uh, particularly in Hong Kong and Singapore, was uh, really a reduction down to far fewer flagship stores. In Hong Kong, some of the bigger brands had up to three flagship stores in, in one city, and that's just unheard of anywhere else in the world. So we're seeing them go back to just uh, one, perhaps two flagship stores uh, in a city, depending on that demand. Um, if you look outside the shopping centers, you then have to look at the three tiers of so prime shop uh, retail, and then the second tier street and the third tier street, a huge difference between the three. Prime is doing okay, but rents and prices are down generally. Um, and then the second and third tier have been really decimated, unfortunately. So there's been this shift towards prime, but even then, um, obviously there's been a change in the mix, far, far much more towards um, small cafes, F&B, and, and, and really affordable luxury, and then lifestyle. So we have seen a, a shift on some of the high streets, but less of a shift inside the shopping centers. And that's why I said the, you know, the future of the shopping center is still there for Asia, primarily because of A, the e-tainment percentage in sh shopping centers is up to 25, even 30, beyond 30%, which is unheard of in, in Europe. Um, but also the, the fact that people like to hang out in shopping centers, they're cool, they're vibrant, um, you can walk around, they're spacious, and they want to shop um, and look at what they can uh, buy. Now, whether they actually buy in the shop or versus online, I think that's what we were discussing. Um, this is where, and I'll talk about it perhaps a little bit later on in terms of that partnership between uh, the owners, the landlords and the retailers, but also the third player, the, the customer. I'll leave it at that for the time being, but it just gives you a general 
snapshot of, of where we are from a, a real estate perspective. Okay. Hey, um, that, that, that was a great opening from everyone. Um, from a real estate perspective, has, is there any benchmark to, to what's happening now? Is there any um, rule book? Is there any you playbook? Are... I mean, you... I mean, uh, no, there's no rule book. <laughs> um, what are the rule books? Well, one rule book is double digit growth is a thing of the past. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, that was just the norm in the early 2000s, as I said. I think the next um, benchmark is when will the tourists come back? And just if I take Hong Kong, we were talking a little bit earlier about the opening up of the border. And, and I'm making these numbers up to make a point here. But if you can imagine when Hong Kong opens up the border, and the Chinese have had nowhere to go for the last three, four months. You can imagine two million Chinese walking across the Hong Kong and Macau borders um, to go and entertain and shop. Now that's great on the one hand with the big dollar signs, but you know then there's other issues in terms of just that social distancing. So no real benchmarks, I'd say, Anthony. But uh, I think there are some things that we're waiting for to see what happens. I mean, obviously, in terms of the basic necessities, that's continued to be fine. But if we're talking purely luxury, you know, that's, that's obviously come way down. Those sales need to start to pull, pull back up. I think it'll be a slow recovery, personally. And these revenge purchasing and, and buying that we've seen in China on odd days, I'm not sure is sustainable. But I, I'd like to hear other people's views. OK. OK. Um... Should we move on to the next question? Does anyone yeah. else like to add anything? Okay. Um, what are the options for the jewelry segment to try to overcome this deadlock? Um, again, would you like to start, Nigel? <laughs> okay. Well, <laughs> okay. Okay. No, geez, great. We have to be creative. Um, the problem is that this industry is pretty much decided, divided between brands and manufacturers. And certain manufacturers trying to be in between brands and wholesalers, kind of getting a bit of both. Um, this is a time to really make a change and be creative, either with the way you're selling, of course, with the concept of, of a collection and all with the materials we're using, maybe reusing materials would be a very good idea. Using different things like we are trying now to experiment with, of course, ceramic, wood, um, aluminum, recyclable items. Um, this is something that I think might be somehow an option to look at various either places. Um, but the way to do business at the end of the day, the center of all this is going to be probably the most complicated part is the material that like diamonds and gold. Right now, it's very big uncertainty on the market. Um, people don't want to invest too much on gold because they think the price is too high. What if we lock ourselves into pricing and then we start producing jewelry and then the prices go down after the lockdown in certain markets? So it's a little bit too much uncertainty around. <laughs> now, how to overcome this? I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know really how to do it except for just as I said earlier, being creative come up with new ideas. If you are a brand that we're selling only through retailers, maybe time to go online. Um, look, go back and look at your customers because you know the customers that you already had are always like, the chance is quite high that they will come back to you. Um, this is also a very good chance for many companies to fix their mistakes. We all made mistakes in the past as businesses. This is the time to really think about it and see if you can make a change. Maybe this is the time to do it. Uh, you kind of practice what you preach because um, recently you went from being a manufacturer and a designer to opening a retail store in Tokyo. Right. Yes. We venture into retail as well. Yes, we yes. have. Yes. <laughs> which, um, well, you know, which is uh, one way of being creative and innovative. Um, anyone else would like to add anything? Okay. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah, I just want to add one more point that it is time to educate. And uh, I think uh, we need a new generation of clients. Um, I, I, I certainly feel that because, you know, you see the online sale from the numbers that is to tell, you know, South Beach, every sale, we have about 30% new buyers coming in. And we find that most likely they are under 40s. So which means it's it's a good, very good sign. And it's not just about jewelry. It's across the category, including 
wine, watches, uh, contemporary art, even uh, for photographs and other, you know, other uh, paintings, uh, Chinese works of art. So in general, younger generation are spending money. And with all this, you know, new technology, online bidding system, I think it's quite the experience. And if we can add on some value um, to what they experience, I think that's, that's the point. I think right now, uh, a lot of people are learning online. And you know, if we, we, we could provide something that unique uh, experience or something value adding, I think it's a good way to grow potential clients. That's my point. But somehow, if I may, sorry to interrupt, I somehow have the feeling that the future of this industry is going to be still a combination of offline and online. If you look at each market, they are very different. In our industry, if you look at um, luxury goods, for example, I take two big examples. Yeah, two big luxury goods consumer markets, Japan and China. In Japan, most of the consumers of luxury goods are mostly like, let's say, jewelry and watches. They are mostly men and they are above 50, the people who are actually buy and purchasing those goods. Now, if you look at China, the African consumers, they are mostly 25 to 35 years old. So obviously it's a very big age gap over there and their preferences, how they shop are different. Like when I looked at Japan, people still like to go to Ginza and do, it's a lifestyle. They shop, they like to spend time looking at those items that they're buying, they, have, they like touching them. Actually, it's also very convenient, obviously. So I do believe the future will be a combination of both. People purchase online, especially luxury goods, because they already tested, tried them offline first. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah, um, you know, perhaps, you know, I can also share a combination of uh, a personal view and what I collect, you know, uh, hear from, you know, um, other leaders that, you know, I speak with, you know, quite often. Uh, I think that first of all, you know, from a, a customer point of view, I think these days, you know, um, as you mentioned, I mean, we have to be creative because, I mean, um, there's no one formula for all because, I mean, you have like, you know, different customer, you know, some customer, you know, they are, you know, these days are looking for more, you know, value for money types of item or the sort of more easy to wear daily jewelry because these days, you know, when you talk about even post pandemic, you know, perhaps, you know, the sort of last scale, uh, you know, whining and dining party, you know, may comes down. So you, you will be thinking, you know, if I buy jewelry, so when should I wear, when will be the occasions? So I think, you know, partially, you know, it's also, uh, you know, our lim I mean, our social life, you know, being you know limited in some way you know we also you know sort of uh, you know demotivate us you know to buy you know more high value item unless you know you buy it from an investment angle so i think you know the creativity on product or using different material as you know necessary you know you have said you know i think that is relevant but then, then i think on the other hand is about you know perhaps you know the channel you know how you can you know um engage the customer in a different way. Because I mean, I also, you know, of the belief that in the future, probably, you know, it's still a combination of online and offline because at the end of the day, luxury is good. We probably, we still want that, you know, touch and feel, you know, before, before you buy. Uh, then, you know, what it means is like, if we cannot go to say, for example, to the auction yeah, house, you know, by, you know, in person, then you know, perhaps there's some form of like online, um, I won't say exhibition, but I mean, it's like, you know, how you can, you know, put an um, convening event, virtual convening event, you know, for, you know, the product or for your collection. I think that will be really helpful because, you know, if I learn from some of the, um, you know, lot, not what I call, you know, the, uh, you know, luxurious customer, but if, but if you look at some like, you know, MA or, well, MA of the world, they're selling different things. But I mean, they are so good on, you know, having demonstration online, convening online. And actually, you know, people engagement level are very high. And I believe that, you know, the luxury and also the jewelry segment, you know, can perhaps, you know, learn some of the lesson of, you know, using a very creative way, you know, to engage the customer and also increase, you know, the buying desire. I think that's, you know, will be, you know, quite, you know, important, you know, as well. And then, you know, of course, I think customer experience is also important. Uh, and I'm not talking about just simply, you know, when you are buying, you know, how you, the, you know, click on your website you know, from the, um, you know, purchasing and delivery, you know, apart from, you know, that online experience, I believe that, you know, there's got to be some more creative way of thinking about, you know, what customers uh, experience mean. Now, what I heard from some of my LVMX friends, they were saying, um, I, they, I'm not quite sure, you know, which country. Now, these days, they, they, they said that, you know, some countries are so creative, they are having, you know, the delivering person to dress in tuxedo, 
So when you buy some product, you know, they bring somebody dressed nicely, deliver personally to your home in a tuxedo. So I think that's also a very good customer experience in a very different way. And I believe people will, re will remember that. So I think just a few sort of, um, you know, points that, you know, I, ha I have heard, you know, from others, but also from a customer yeah, point of definitely. view, it may differentiate as well. There are definitely a few online retailers already doing that, like Mr. Port and Eta Porte and a few others. I think there are a few in China as well doing that. Obviously, it's a 360 experience. The customer wants that. If I buy a luxury good and I want to feel luxurious when I receive it, that's a matter that I receive it just in a box. Yeah. What are customers willing to buy online? It's um, I, I, uh, Sotheby's has been very successful with online sales, but... Um, you know, the challenge is um, those $10 million diamonds or the um, um, cashmere sapphires and, and, the, and the Burma rubies. Um, are people willing, not now, I, I think not now, but, but maybe in the future, will people be willing to purchase these kinds of um, products, these kinds of um, rare, rare products online? Thanks, Anthony. I guess that question I have to answer. Yeah. Uh, it's a great question. Actually, we've been testing. Uh, just about uh, two weeks ago, we launched a, a single lot sale online. It's one, just one item. It's a Tutti Frutti bracelet from Cartier, uh, 1930s. And uh, we had estimation 600 to 800,000 US dollars for just one lot in the single lot sale. And it's been on for uh, barely one week, I think four or five days. And then we sold for 1.34 million US dollars, so 1 million 340,000, which is almost you know, over double of the uh, uh, pre-auction estimation. So that means signature special pieces. If, if, um, you know, if people see the value, uh, I, I guess moving forward, it's gonna be a trend that as Catherine mentioned that higher value piece is gonna be um, available and you, both buying and selling side will feel more and more confident to offer online. Of course, if it's a special, uh, I say cashmere sapphire, or we're talking about Columbia, Noah uh, Emerald or Burmese Tajan Black Ruby, these are uh, require higher I think uh, a technology to show the real color of the, the stone. Mm -hmm. And that is something I believe, I'm a strong believer of technology. I think in the near future, this can be solved. So when, when you actually experience a exhibition before you have to try it on, I think in the future, you just have your VR and then mm -hmm. that's it. You can uh, go through all the museum, all the auction previews, uh, even uh, in retail shopping. So uh, we are on the, I think we are on the uh, direction. Okay, good. good. Yes, yes, but the, you know, the, Cart the Cartier Tutti Frutti is still a um, signed jewel as opposed to um, high valued um, gemstone or diamond. So I don't know, it's, it's certainly in the right direction for, for these type of sales. And are, you, are is um, Sotheby's starting to do assessments online as well? We do actually. Uh, that that's uh, something we've been developing. We have a uh, uh, valuation online platform. Uh, if you go to the WeChat, even the WeChat or the APP, you can take a photo and upload uh, for a quick valuation. And in Asia, we try to offer offer a service like twenty four hour. Uh, within twenty four hours, we provide professional free valuation. So I think it's a, it's a unique experience we launched uh, since uh, last month and we already got uh, a few hundred uh, potential uh, requests and it's been growing. I, I think uh, even, you know, requests from Australia, from uh, Japan. So it's, it's very regional and not just related to uh, China or Hong Kong. Um, and something really interesting. Uh, you never imagined you could see something that special. So I, I think people not just uh, are trying to buy from online, but also they want to sell online now. Okay, very good. Um, let's see. What kind of strategic initiatives are needed to combat the crisis within the industry? Who would like to start, Nachisa? 
<laughs> me again. How about you answer that one? What do you think? You meet a what lot of companies, a lot of brands. You, you travel around the world. Mm -hmm. Well, I think, I think in the diamond industry, they need to be more, um, more open with information with um, need to be, they need, they need to be more of a disclose more about the, about how diamonds are um, mined, how, how there's, how they circulate through the economy. I think that will get, I, that will do well to um, get the people's trust. Um, as far as what retailers can do, I'm not, I'm not sure. I think I think retailers are, are in a difficult position right now, and and a lot of manufacturers because the jewelry industry is a high margin is a no it's a it's a low margin it's a low margin industry but um, the level of debt they, they they acquire in order to sell it can can be very high and and I think a lot of these companies are going to be over leveraged, and from the people I spoke with um, it's 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 that way right now, so. There's going to be a shrinkage, for sure. But mm -hmm. um, I, I really don't have an answer of what retailers and manufacturers can do right now. I mean, I mean, you could do all the right things, be sustainable, um, 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 be more efficient in your manufacturing, but but a lot of them already are very efficient. I think also some of the retailers could use this opportunity when prices are going down for retail space. If they do have trust in a certain market, this is the time to actually open up a store. Mm -hmm. If you know? they have the funding. Yes. Yes. Also, a lot of the manufacturers, they can recycle all the gold and the diamonds they have and they can create a new collection. They can pull back whatever they think is not working and just remake it. Again, yeah. as I said, people can still get creative about things. Okay, exactly. Yeah, from a, um, perhaps I'll just jump in here from, a, again, a real estate perspective. You're actually absolutely right, Natchisa. The, um, the opportunity for uh, international brands to come into Asia, uh, if I just talk about Hong Kong as one example, to get into some of these prime shopping centers, it's a once in a lifetime <coughs> opportunity. And coupled with what I said earlier, how some of the flagship stores are starting to pull back. But I think the real opportunity here from a retail perspective is you, you've got to work in partnership more now with your landlord than ever before. And, and even if that means, you know, not just in terms of your shop front, but also looking at the things that they're going to do, what are the pop-up opportunities that you've got within the center? And then how are you getting information back through the sales force from the customers? And it's, there's almost a loop, uh, uh, there in the sense that if you can understand what the customers are wanting, bring that back into the marketing and the promotion, then suddenly you can change the reputation of the brand. And then once you start getting that reputation out there, of course, people start to talk more. Um, in the old days, if we look at China, um, a lot of the developers were actually paying for the retailers to come in everything, uh, the whole stock, staff, everything. And it really was just an advertisement well, what's the difference now in some respects? You need your advertisements at your shop front, but then you need the sales staff and the promotion and the strategy to try and get that consumer brand and reputation going. Uh, but it is certainly an opportunity for new entrants to get into Asia. Especially for those with a long-term plan. Whoever right. is looking for like three, five to 10 years plan, then for sure they can get a lot of benefits right now from, from entering. No, that's right. And, and be very specific. I mean, gone are the days. I remember when um, a very large uh, footwear manufacturer came in, this would be 10 years ago, and they said, we want to set up two and a half thousand stores in China. And, and we were appointed to do the uh, marketing study for it. You know, it, it never happened. It, it never could happen. But I think if you come in, you're very strategic on the city. And then obviously, as I said earlier, whether it's a shopping center or a particular street, a prime shopping street, then that's the way to go. And, and almost it's people want something a bit unique. That's where pop-up stores came from originally, right? Um, you, you sort of had one-offs coming from this. It was a low level, of course, it's not luxury, but that's where it started. And I think if you're very specific about where you want to be, uh, that's the way forward from a retail perspective. I also see we have here, sorry. I see we have here an interesting comment from someone. During this pandemic, customers also are buying natural colored diamonds as an investment, special pink and blue diamonds. Any comments here? <laughs> They've always done that. Yes, they have. 
Yes. Yes, they have. Is it is it a hedge? Is 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 um is it, I mean, is he saying it's a hedge of this uncertain economy, like gold buying is? I don't know if it's necessarily a hedge, but uh, if you look back in time, if you look at the prices, then definitely they go higher in price, much faster than anything else. And right. again, by uniqueness, mm -hmm. supply right. and demand. You don't have enough supply. They're very unique. More people want to have them. And and um and 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 in and in the auction market, are they still rising through the pandemic? They haven't really been sold the past, you know, <laughs> no live auctions. I'm wondering if the but you would know if there's still demand. Uh definitely. Uh actually, even from the trade, you know, they keep constantly asking me if we find something really special and they're interested to purchase. I think uh for pink and blue in the past decades. Uh, you know, the price has been very steady going up uh, instead of all the other uh, uh, investment, you know, uh, like property or artworks, especially for pink and blue diamond, the high quality, a large size, uh, the return on investment is quite steady. So I, I, I guess we're going to see, you know, uh, many things going on coming up in June in July, because you know all these auction houses, especially the major one, uh, the sale going on in New York, in Geneva, and Hong Kong, uh, you will be surprised uh, how confident you know our collectors uh, are looking for these kind of special, special uh, gemstones. Okay, that's great. Should we move on to the next question? Because it's interesting that someone is asking about sustainable fashion. And the next question has to go has to has to deal with um, eco consciousness and consumer influence and sustainability. So I think Narchiza has a lot to say about this. So would you like to start? Uh, sure. Everybody knows I'm a very 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 big advocate supporter of sustainability. And um, honestly, if we don't think of future and being sustainable, I don't think we have a planet at all proof right now what's happening, right? So we have to be a little bit more careful. I mean, yes, profits are important. Of course, economy matters. Business is very important. But how about we create businesses that are sustainable and help to the environment, help the environment as well, not just destroy it. Obviously, fashion, luxury goods, we come from an industry that pollutes a lot. And to be entirely honest with you, I never understood why we need so much fast fashion. Why do we need so many fashion weeks? It's not sustainable. Why do we need to have always the new thing? Why every six months or every three months we have to have something new on a catwalk and we need to have it immediately? What's wrong with what we just bought last year? If it's good quality, always brands say it's good quality, it's fantastic quality, cannot be better than this, then why can't we just not wear that? And if you look at the trends now, all the big brands are actually quite concerned with it. I mean, you have Stella McCartney, you have a couple of the very big designers out there being very careful and advocating a lot for sustainability. In our industry as well, in jewelry, as I was saying earlier, a lot of the new designers are trying to recycle the gold. I always encourage our clients to recycle the old, well, reform the old jewelry. I always say, yes, you want a new stone, a new piece of jewelry, not a problem. We can create a new piece for you. But if there's anything that you want to incorporate in that new piece that you have already, we can use that gold and those diamonds or any other stones you have. Very good. Um, the marketing of, of sustainability. Do you, do you, there's, a lot of, there's a lot of marketing where, you know, there's there's a lot of talk out there, but there, I don't I don't think there's a lot of um a lot of backing up. Maybe a ten percent discount or something like that. It just doesn't really add up sometimes. Unfortunately, a lot of the companies still just talk about sustainability, but they don't do anything per se, except for yes, campaigns. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's all about like we donate here, we donate there, we support this, we support that. But changing the whole business, this will be probably the beginning. We start slowly, slowly seeing a lot of companies when they really make a major change. And it's really difficult For to example, change yeah. business to make it more sustainable. Yeah. Is it not? Right. Uh, yeah, I want to add to uh, Narissa's point that, uh, for example, Southbees, uh, we are planning to reduce printing catalog, printed catalog uh, 
significantly. So uh, uh, from quantity and frequency, you won't you it will be sad to miss those you know piles of piles of catalog because we got you know it's a trend because we got com complaint from some of our collectors. They receive all these catalogs from different auction houses every season, every month, and it's become a huge waste. So uh, you know with all this new technology, the screen, the color. Everything is uh, up to uh, cutting edge, you know, technology to, to present the, uh, the uh, quality of the work, the color, everything. So I believe that in the future, probably there's no, not much printed catalog you will see for auction. I think that's a, a big uh, commitment from uh, Southbase. I believe this is a, you know, uh, the industry will, will make the change and starting with the catalog. I would say that you know um, sustainability, you know, is is a journey for everybody because I don't think that you know it's just you know the jewelry industry. I think that you know this is a very, uh, you know, timely, you know, universally uh, universal subject um, because I mean because of the pandemic, I think that right now you know actually that's um, sort of pushed a lot of uh, you know people, uh, you know, from um, enterprise point of view or from a personal point of view to reflect you know how we spend. And then also, you know, reflect, you know, as uh, Narcissa has said, I mean, do we need like a new clothes every day um, or every season? So I think that will be probably, you know, that will be a very big reflection, uh, you know, to relook into, you know, how, you know, we, um, you know, how we purchase. And also in particular, um, you know, the jewelry industry and luxury industry, um, you know, the organic growth, you know, will certainly, you know, come from the younger customer. And we all know that, you know, the millennial, you know, are the generations that, you know, very, you know, is very big on, you know, sustainability. So I think that this is, you know, something that will also, you know, push the retailer, you know, to sort of like, you know, think through, um, you know, how perhaps, you know, product to be baked. And then certainly um, luxuries brand probably, you know, might be a little slow in terms of the pace. But if you look at some of the sort of like, um, you know, sports shoes or some other, you know, necessity, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, product, you know, in the market, they already, you know, invent, you know, quite some, you know, new material, you know, if that is, you know, can be recycled or do less harm, you know, to the, uh, you know, to the earth. So I think that this is something particularly, you know, for the luxury and the jewelry industry, uh, you know, we, we really have to sort of think through, you know, on the items that we do or, you know, along the supply chain process, are there any uh, steps of the way that, you know, we can help to save the planet? I think this is something that, you know, everybody, you know, is, um, you know, has to sort of think through at this moment of time. You do bring up a bit of a conundrum in that the same companies that are maybe um, being more sustainable at one end are developing new materials and new, and, and new processes that are likely less sustainable than the other? Um, well, frankly, I don't think anybody, you know, have an answer right now, but yeah. I would say that, you know, simply, I mean, this is the reason why, you know, at this, you know, the, you know, the, the positive side of the pandemic is really to push us to, you know, rethink about, you know, every single thing that we do. Uh, you know, in terms of, you know, our product, you know, our raw material, you know, how we deliver to the, um, uh, you know, to the customer. So I think that, you know, I think that it would be quite interesting, you know, to look at, you know, how the industry will evolve, you know, in the sort of next to 12 months, because that probably, you know, is still a learning, uh, it will be a very big learning curve, you know, for everybody. Um, so, yeah, I don't have an answer, you know, for your question, yeah. but I think this is, you know, something... <laughs> Um, you know, that will be, that will be, you know, quite, quite interesting for everybody to, to, you know, put for thought, I would say. Yeah. Anyone else like that to add? An interesting question. Somebody saying, um, does it mean recycled fashion vintage store business will continue to grow? Definitely. Definitely. We already can see right now, um, a lot of, uh, secondary market is gaining more and more territory. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Okay, yeah, there's a lot of good questions here. I hope we can get to them all. Um, let's see, um, the next one, we've already discussed quite, you know, a lot already, but uh, maybe maybe Nigel might might be able to add to this, the um, how has the botanic pandemic disrupted the retail sector? Well, I, I sort of talked about that a little bit in the beginning. Let me take my glasses off. I talked about that a little bit in the beginning. Um, you know, to be honest, just behind hotels, retail is the most affected sector across Asia. 
Um, so consumer sales are down across the board. Tourism is down across the board. It's going to take a long time for people to get back on a plane. But as I said earlier, um, moving within China and across the Hong Kong border, the Macau border, within Greater Bay Area, that's a huge opportunity. Uh, likewise, you could look at uh, Shanghai, Beijing, um, some of the other cities too, uh, Singapore. So um, there will be opening up eventually um, this, this tourism flow. And that will then eventually move back into the medium uh, you know, uh, luxury um, and then ultimately to the high end. I mean, we haven't seen a real tail off in some of the very high end brands. So there is still uh, consumption going on, but just obviously not at the same rate. That has put a lot of pressure on retail rents and a lot of concessions have been given by uh, the major landlords. But again, if you want that prime retail shop in a shopping mall, you don't give that up. And in some respects, um, <clears throat> those rents uh, discounts haven't been given over. <clears throat> the sort of big five brands out there, I think are all complaining and I, I don't blame them in some respects, but it's that bittersweet pill of retaining location uh, versus trying to reduce your overall, uh, you know, um, rental costs. And, and then if you look at Asia as a whole or China as a whole and compare how Hong Kong was down last year because of the protests in terms of consumer demand, you know, China was up last year, uh, huge spending. And so it balances out in some of these bigger landlords portfolios where they do have properties in, in Hong Kong and China. So I think there's a lot of upside, as I, I said earlier, I think it will be a slow turnaround though, unfortunately, and that's probably uh, because of the slow growth rates that we're gonna see across the world until 2021. Yeah. Nigel, I do have a question for you um, because uh, when I speak with you know, a lot of the brand owners, uh, because of the uh, economic situation right now, um, you know, most believe that you know, there will be a big consolidation and the stronger you know, and the strong brands, you know, will become stronger. Um, also, you know, certain brands, you know, probably will exceed, you know, from the market, you know, quite soon. Um, so early on, you also talk about, you know, the um, retail format. Um, I heard quite a lot of my clients, you know, they are also thinking through about, you know, the uh, retail format transformation. Uh, you know, some will say that perhaps, you know, they, although you know, they will reduce, you know, the number of the flagship store, but perhaps, you know, they will change to more, you know, smaller store, you know, but I mean, with, um, uh, you know, more, you know, better distribution and also perhaps operate at a hybrid model or more agile model, a combination of, you know, pop-up, flagship, or smaller store, you know, to serve the sort of O to O purpose. So, I mean, are you seeing that trend? Because probably you are very close to the market and um, I'm just sort of curious. Yes, yes, we are. So um, we're, we're seeing the flagship stores uh, reducing in footprint size. So it's very, very, you know, um, very hard to find a, a large tenant now. Uh, anything over, uh, well, 10,000 square foot is, is big, whereas before it was over 20,000 square foot. The days of uh, a, a triple story, flagship store uh, is perhaps uh, going, uh, except for the very few. So I think um, at the end of the day, you know, it always comes down to location, 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 um, which is district street floor in my terms. Now you could add floor in terms of, you know, where they are on, on the floor of, of the shopping center or on the high street, or also now where that pop-up is. And I think we've seen pop-ups uh, for lesser brands, of course, in industrial buildings out of the blue. Um, will that happen with the luxury brands? Probably not, but I do like your point about being more agile, and that's certainly going to be the way forward. And, and as online uh, becomes stronger, I mean, we've, the real estate sector struggled with the online piece uh, as that shop front becomes more of an advertisement, as I said. But mm. you know, from a higher brand point of view, people do still like to touch uh, and see the products, sometimes wear it. But uh, I was going around the um, K11 Museum the other day, They've got a private function floor, which has got these, uh, you know, um, uh, special mirrors in that you can see different types of clothes on. So, um, you know, it is happening in terms of that AI, the technology is coming through, and that will change the face of uh, retail in terms of the real estate piece uh, for, for sure. Do you see your retailer have even more uh, creativity on using technology? Because um, some of you know my client, they're more on the manufacturing side, not on the retail side, but they already have very good um, technology, like you know virtual fitting. Because I mean, this is actually you know for their customer, 
uh, is more like a B2B2 rather than a B2C2. But I mean, have you been sort of um, being asked, you know, by your, uh, you know, customer these days, you know, perhaps they would set up some sort of like, I don't know, you know, a technology booth or whatever, you know, to try out some sort of new technology to get uh, new customers? Yeah, yeah it's happening. Uh, absolutely. Um, how quickly it'll happen, I don't know. Uh, as I said, you know, in Asia, we love our shopping centers. Um, maybe we'll take off more in, in Europe, who knows, um, uh, faster. But um, so, oh, what's going on here? I don't know. <laughs> um, Let's move it. Could be that we are being hacked or something? It could be. I was, I was hacked, I was hacked uh, yesterday on a webinar, would you believe? But anyway. Oh, my God. Um, in, in a sense, it just closed down and we all popped up again. But um, <laughs> yes, of course, uh, VR. I mean, it, you were saying, it, Rainbow, uh, you know, earlier, I mean, you're going towards a few brochures, technology, VR. It's all happening. Um, mm. But at the end of the day, if you talk about the younger generation, what they want, you were saying earlier that they're spending. I agree with you. They want new things, new products. So we're going to have to see a lot more creativity coming through that will then end up in the retail stores that they try or they'll, they'll look at it online. You're right. It's going to be a mixture, we believe. Any particular examples of experiences, retail experiences? That was such a big topic before the pandemic in the U.S. anyway, um, that people want to be entertained as well as um, and I'm not just talking about the mall experience, but um, individual retail store experiences. Is, are, are there any examples of that in Asia? Because well, when I go to the malls, I, I see wonderful, beautiful stores that people that's shop. That's right. I think look, a good example, I was there relatively recently, so it's fresh in my mind, not to pick on one particular one, but K K11 Museum, where you know, mm. in most of the shops, there's some unique piece of art because Adrian Cheng loves his art. And he's created it, not just from the shopping center's point of view, but also from the inside retail experience. And so we, we've had those sort of open shops with, with, you know, without a front per se, that was the Apple model. But you're starting to see art come inside uh, mm. retail. And I think that's really interesting and innovative. Great. Narchise, as a retailer, as a new retailer, have you learned anything? Well, we are not really retailers per se. I mean, we had our agents in Japan who opened up the store. Okay. Um, yes, people like to have more of a lifestyle combination. They identify with the brand if they believe in the values of the brand. And again, somebody made a very interesting comment earlier here. The brand is not just, yes, it's about the story. Um, yes, it's about the story, but in our case, it's not just the story, it's also the product. So it should be a combination of both. At the end of the day, a brand is a promise. Yes, you give a promise to people that they will have an extraordinary experience. And consumers are getting more and more sophisticated. One thing I realize is that brands need to get a bit more humble after this pandemic. Some of them still don't get it out there. They still go, this is what I do. You got to follow me because this is how I do things and it's my way or no other way. This has to change. Consumers are exactly telling us what they need and what they want. We just need to listen a little bit more and that's it. Yeah, I've been seeing that in the watch industry. Um, there's been a big trend on steel watches the past couple of years, and that is direct result of, of consumers on chat forums and on um, online requesting this. So this is like the beginning of the watch industry actually react, reacting to consumer needs, which is a huge change from how they did business just a few years ago. So, um, yeah, it's, 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 I, think, I think it's happening. It's easy to do because of, because everything's available online. You can see what people want online. Yes, and I think luxury should get back to what it really was, art. Mm -hmm. Luxury goods, because all those products were always a piece of art. It's something that takes so many hours to make and it's so intricate and so special. And the craftsmanship is fantastic. Somehow it all became almost mass luxury recently. People could get all these new bags every month and new jewelry and new clothes. And there was nothing special except for the name and the price tag. This is going to change. Now consumers are going to get peak here now and they will want more, not just value, but uniqueness. Mm. Okay. Um. Yeah. Yeah, I heard that, you know, quite, quite often, you know, from my, uh, you know, different, you know, luxury uh, segments of client as well, because if you really, you know, think about, you know, luxury, I mean, it's about, you know, craftsmanship and also exclusivity and also differentiation, but also, you know, these days, you know, if we think about, you know, the young customer, luxury is also an experience as well. So, I mean, you know, from, 
from how you reach the product, access to the product, and how you touch and feel and engage with the product. I think this customer journey, I mean, this is also, you know, a time that people have to think about that, you know, differently. So, you know, the, the engagement, you know, become, you know, really so important. And I believe that, you know, if giving all things equal, then, you know, who, you know, whoever, you know, can create a very different customer experience virtually or physically, I think that they will be the winner these times. Yeah. Definitely. Um, let's see the next question. We're getting near the end here, yeah. I think. And this is what I think brands and even um, um, independent jewelers and, and, and luxury companies are doing. What can brands do to stay connected with their loyal clients? Um, somebody is <laughs> on my screen. Did you yeah, hear the question? I think, uh... Yeah, I, I think from uh, from auction perspective, uh, we've been doing a lot of online sales this year. And uh, what happened is, uh, you know, we got clients that they're not used to bid online. We have to really uh, teach them step by step, you know, go through the process, how to register, how to download the APP on the phone and how to participate. I think all these, you know, it's kind of a service. You, it's, you grow with the client, you know, um, and try to adopt the new technology and they appreciate it. And then it's a cool thing that a lot of uh, second generation of uh, our, you know, uh, traditional or loyal client, uh, now they try to bid online and then we try to create something. Right now it's happening, we have a manga sale, uh, you know, it's all Japanese uh, cartoon, you know, this kind of uh, new new style for uh, collection, you know, collect collections. And uh, it seems everything got sold and you can check online, it's like you see, uh, Naruto, or you see, uh, uh, you know, all these uh, cartoon figures, and and I, I feel that very cool because it's uh, quite familiar to the generation. So we, I think for 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 auction perspective, like we try to offer cross category experience, and you know, it's not just the uh, the client we we take care of, but the whole maybe the whole family, maybe they have different uh, um, interests in different categories. So we we try to offer a comprehensive one-stop shopping experience for our online sales. So you see watch online, wine online, jewelry, contemporary art, everything there. And I, I think also it is a good, a good trend. We see a lot of crossover. Like for example, uh, you know, like uh, Shisa uh, mentioned, you know, uh, brand joined together with art as one thing and even uh, different brands, you know, they create something unique and then offer in the, in the auction to make a, uh, a very, a very strong uh, statement to the market. I think these are very creative and uh, we just make sure, we just have to make sure the experience for, for bidding, for uh, make payment, for all the uh, uh, post sale, uh, be more like more and more convenient for our client. And we try to uh, still, uh, you know, improving and learning. Yes. Yes, um, the post selling definitely works very well, actually co-branding as well. We, we've been approached by a luxury manufacturer from UK recently, especially for the same reason. And uh, it makes sense if you feel that the, the brand values are similar. But one thing, what I see that is very important right now for a change, brands should start listening to their consumers. It's always the brand telling people what to do. It's always the brand selling the story and talking, talking, talking. I mean, everybody has amazing marketing people and PR. It's about time to actually listen to the consumers if you want to keep them. Yeah, I think probably, you know, when you say, you know, um, listen to the customer, I think it's the personalization. Because I mean, right now, if you cannot go to the shop or, or in the past, when you went into the shop, you're one of the many customer. But when you're online, it's almost like a one on one experience, you know, with, you know, the brand. So I think this is actually a great opportunity to, you know, put in a lot more personalized element. Um, you know, to actually, you know, connect the customer because, I mean, this is a direct, you know, contact, you know, with your customer, you know, rather than, you know, you connect, you know, with an enterprise, you know, through 
perhaps you know salespeople or through the store. So I think this is also a you know a, a different you know experience as well. So you know you know when we talk about you know how to stay connected you know with the loyal customer, I think the content is important. I I do see that you know more and more co branding or partnership, and the partnership could be sort of a you know cross segment may not be like you know jewelry with um, you know just luxury brand you know could be also with some other you know lifestyle product in a different category but create a different luxury lifestyle because I'm I think that you know luxury to a lot of people it's not just about product is that is the experience in totality so yeah. um, you know probably create a different you know experience you know as I you know mentioned a couple of time but I think what's the content to make that differentiation um, you know, it's also important. And I think that's how, you know, to uh, make the customer, you know, remembers you. Uh, I so I think that's a, that's a differentiation as well. Definitely. Most brands, they need to change the point of view. Has always been like us, our story, be part of our world. Now the world has changed. Consumer wants to know, how about me? I'm buying the product. How about I feel special and you create something where I'm the center of the universe. I don't want to buy into your story all the time. People will want personalization more and more and more. I think the true luxury is to be unique. I want something that I'm the only one who has it. I don't want to buy a bag just because it has a label's name and I want to be like everybody else where 10,000 other people have the exact same item, know exactly the price, anybody can check it online. So the real luxury is going to be customization, to have one unique item, one of a kind. I think they are starting to do that. In the watch industry, it's a, they're definitely yes. doing it. Yes. Um, jewelry, I, jewelry is jewelry is it's difficult to change. Um, these are family-owned. These are smaller companies, and they and they and they and they and they do things in a traditional way. And as far as marketing, as far as how they create um, collections, how they do things, how the you know how goods are distributed across the globe, it's it's um. It's, it's a harder nut to crack, I think. It's not as fast moving in general as, as a lot, and it's not um, centrally controlled, like say the luxury watch industry or a lot of fashion brands that are owned by conglomerates and they can, um, and, and they can um, you know, create strategies that, that go across the brands. But um, I, I think maybe that is starting too. Yeah, yeah. Well, there is also a positive side for Anthony's point that we see a quite increasing interest on antique jewelry, period jewelry. So, uh, you know, the uh, the antique becomes a new fashion uh, mm -hmm. for jewelry. Uh, as we've seen a, a lot, and we, we know that even in Geneva and New York sale, a lot of pieces are purchased by Asian clients, a young generation. Uh, just so uh, we had experience that uh, late last year, we, we sponsored a uh, uh, antique jewelry exhibition in Shenzhen. And that was the first time in mainland China, there's a, a high, uh, uh, high value and also, uh, you know, a curated kind of uh, collection by, you know, a couple of uh, in their early 30s. So it's quite amazing. And uh, we really appreciate the opportunity. So I think all this going on, what what uh, what we need is to educate, um, even uh, educate ourselves, you know. But it is an experience. I, I think it's coming up. Uh, just you know, it's a, it's a good thing. It's a very positive thing that antique jewelry now become a new fashion. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It is. So that's an interesting question, Anthony. You might want to talk about it. The impact on international show. Yes, I saw that. Um, it's you know, I just did a story about the coronavirus and how it affected every part of the jewelry industry, and, and including trade shows. And one person said, trade shows are still important. They're just not as important as they used to be. And maybe that's the, um, the takeaway. Every, every trade show in the jewelry and watch industry is different. And they each have their own challenges. They each have, I, I see the September Hong Kong jewelry and gem shows still being the the largest trade show in the world, but um, with all the regional problems of the past couple of years in Hong Kong and, and the and the you know the pandemic, it's 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 going to be difficult for them. But they're still going to be the one. Basel World is pretty much done. It's finished, and mostly because it was self self inflicted wounds, largely. So and, and 
the shame of it is that Bob's World was a place where watch companies and jewelry companies um, exhibited new, new items. It was a PR show and it was a publicity show as much as it was, you know, a sales, as much as it was commerce happening. The Hong Kong show is totally commerce. There, there's no, there's no um, engaging with the consumer or, or engaging with the press or engaging with anything. It is, it is 100% commerce. So you don't have that excitement. Bosworth used to be an exciting show. It was huge and there was fashion shows and there was all sorts of activities going on around it. And um, that is going to be missed. There, there is, there's a void now in that type of a show. The rest are regional shows. The ones in Las Vegas are regional and the ones in, in Europe are regional. Except maybe Vicenza or Oro. That may be the biggest benefit <laughs> that may benefit the, the most from um, from all this change, but still, it's it you know it's it, it's hard to replace Basel. I think I think you still need trade shows, but they're not as important as they used to be. And 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 in the same note, uh, industries, the 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 associations that are around used you know to to exhibit. To provide jewelry, you'd, you'd, have to, you'd have to go through a retailer. To go through a retailer, you have to go through a trade show. To go through a trade show, you have to go through the, the levels of organizations and associations that um, connect you to the retailer. I think, I think that is flattening as well. Yes. So, Definitely. Definitely. so you know, yes. so there'll be fewer trade shows. There'll be the, the, ones that are, the ones that are there will be more important than ever. And um, that's it. <laughs> Do we have any other questions here? Because I, I see a lot of people try to ask us questions. We, we can take maybe any questions right now. Right. You need to follow her. Chico, follow her, follow her. Mm -hmm. Okay. Maybe better to type them because it would be very hard to know who's talking. <laughs> Yes. yes. There's one about the changing definition of luxury. Does anyone want to handle that? We've been talking about that. Oh, well, I think we just discussed uh, okay. the definition of luxury quite earlier. Sorry, we're just talking about pets. Just, my dog is here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Yes. What about made the order? Karen Livio had um, had a question about made the order luxury. Um, with, with technology today, with distribution being um, um, faster today, for a lot of products, um, you can you can order something created in your own way. Well, I don't know if they made to order. They mean like three D printing at home, or what they mean? No, 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 no. no, no. No, like ordering a, a, a luxury handbag online and, and choosing the colors, choosing the design, and then having it made for you. And in a few weeks, it gets delivered to you. Yes, but again, that's part of choices. They're not necessarily a luxury. You get choices. You get a bag and the design and colors are already decided by the company. You just make your own mix and match. That's all. Right. So that's already happening quite a lot. That's not going to be anything new, but the mm -hmm. true unique one of a kind products, this will happen more and more, especially in the jewelry world. People want to have their say in the designs now, more and more uh, from engagement ring. Before it used to be, I go to certain retailer, I buy from there because it's always a little blue box or whatever engagement. Now things have changed. People want to have something where they have a say in the design. Well, that's the same thing, yes. Yes. <laughs> Um, um, yes, and, and it leads to probably this question about um, has my job changed over the past 20 years? Can you repeat? I can't hear you. Sorry. I'm sorry. Um, do yeah. you think the definition of high jewelry has changed over the last 20 years? I think I can answer that. I think it, I think it has. I think there's, there, and in fact, a lot of it's coming from Asia. You have the Wallace Chans, the Cindy Chow, um, Anna Hu, uh, Michelle Ong, the, the last 20 years have exploded with, um, with these Asian designers. 
and there's even younger ones coming up now. Um, and, and, and they're creating beautiful things. They're using titanium in a lot of cases, which was a, a material that rarely was used in high jewelry, but is now, you know, commonplace among, among the jewelers coming from Asia. So it's, um, so the changes, yes, there's been changes. Technology, another thing about luxury is that um, it's a traditional handmade product, but, but, it, but luxury has always been a forerunner in technology. Mm -hmm. And, and that's what really you have to get back to. So a lot of the Asian jewelers, Wallace Chan is very interested in technology as well as creating jewels by hand. Mm. So, and, um, and because of that, he created a porcelain that doesn't break and, and he's working on all kinds of materials and, and, and processes and techniques that are um, really changing the way people are looking at jewelry. So yes, the definition has changed. The, 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 the main definition is one-of-a-kind pieces using um, creative materials and, and, and wonderful designs and, and, and hand craftsmanship hasn't changed, but um, the technology has, has an imagination has really created a new way of looking at it. And uh, just to add to, uh, to add to this point, yes, uh, you know, from Asia, especially, uh, you know, auction, we see a lot of uh, brand start use uh, different materials, uh, as Anthony mentioned, uh, titanium, aluminum, all these different uh, materials with high jewelry. And recently, I recognized some big brand launched their uh, high jewelry line with jadeite, and that is uh, quite new for more than jewelry. Yes, uh, I saw some exhibition in uh, in Taiwan. Uh, that's quite interesting, and I think the brand are listening, and they, you know they start to uh, look for what client or what customer looking for. I think that's a, that's an interesting sign to follow. Very good. So, um, is there anything else we need to discuss? It's, we, we, it's um, after 10 now, we started early. I think yes. this will conclude it. Uh, main word is about transparency. Yes, 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 yes. Okay, the names from Plus One don't see relevant. No, of course not. <laughs> <laughs> Are we just being mean now? <laughs> no, no, of course not. You know, they have history and heritage and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're, the brands have certainly changed over the years since, since so some of them are owned by conglomerates and they have, um, they have to um, maintain a bottom line on a quarterly basis. Mm -hmm. So their offerings are more diverse than they used to be. They still have amazing workshops. No, they're, they're, they're still extremely relevant. I think somebody misunderstood my answer earlier. Made word, it's about transparency and about who made the jewelry, not the, it's emotional and not mix and match. Somebody probably totally misunderstood what I said. <laughs> yeah, that's totally, that's all right. Yes, of course. Fantastic. Um, anything else, any other questions? Otherwise I think, yes, we've been a little bit over 10 o'clock. It's getting late in Hong Kong. It's morning for you there. <laughs> Oh, I think I misread her question. The names of Place Vendôme are still are still as relevant as they were. I, I answered it no. Of course, it's yes. <laughs> oh, good, good. <laughs> so I misread the, but yeah, absolutely, still as relevant. Yes, and I think I think this does end it because um, we've been here more th more than an hour. Thank you there, for everyone who's joined today. It, it was a lot of people here. And a lot of wonderful questions that I wish we had a chance to get to. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you for joining us. Thank you for the question. Thank you. Thank you for everything. And thank you to all the people who, um, who are involved with this. It's, 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 it's been really great. Thank you. Yeah, thank, thank you, everyone. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for thank having you. me here. Thank you. It's fun. Thank you. We are thank going you. to have it live on the um, live and also the recording will be posted, I think, tomorrow across all social medias for those who couldn't join us.
Very good. Great. And you can see the questions tomorrow as well. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thanks, everyone. Good night. Bye-bye. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night.